Okay, good afternoon and welcome everybody to uh, another of our Jane webinar training series. This is actually our 25th uh, Lunch and Learn that we've done since, uh, since the end of March. So thank you all for being a part of that. Uh, today we're gonna talk about something that is really important to all of us and that's uh, filtration and it's selecting the right system. Now, um, you know that you are on to a good subject when you first put this information up that we're gonna do a webinar series on this and you get over 100 people to sign up in the first hour. Now, those are really amazing numbers. Uh, we've had quite a few more since then, but you see the interest right away. And it's always interesting to us to see uh, uh, what is uh, interesting to all of you uh, and that way we know when we need to present uh, you know, more information about these. So today, um, like I said, we're gonna be talking about filtration and selecting the right system. Uh, fortunately, uh, we've got Kevin Stewart back to uh, lead this discussion. You know, uh, Kevin is our uh, director of sales for our ag sales across the US. Uh, he's a certified irrigation specialist uh, recognized by the Irrigation Association. But for me, Kevin is so much more than that title or that uh, certification. And he's got other certifications too. Uh, but the reason why I trust so much, uh, uh, Kevin so much in these situations is because his background and his passion for agriculture are really high. And when it comes to filtration and ag, it can really be a, a game changer for uh, your season. So uh, I'm really excited to have Kevin on and uh, speaking today. As usual, we've got uh, the uh, chat uh, box open as well as the Q&A. So if you have questions, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A, and I'll, re uh, I'll uh, be relaying those questions to Kevin and our other presenters. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Kevin. Kevin, welcome. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to uh, spend some time talking about filtration. And uh, happy to be here uh, presenting with uh, two of my colleagues from Gene Irrigation. And, uh, so why don't we just dive right into it and uh, kind of talk about filtration and uh, really selecting the right system. Um, you know, we, uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, talking about this and we feel like it's really important to educate, um, you know, the, the, our, our dealers and growers on, uh, you know, what is the right system? You know, how can you get the most out of your filtration system and really what should you be filtering? Uh, we hope that uh, throughout this webinar, um, that those that are participating can take, you know, a few bullet points uh, back with them uh, so that they can make, uh, you know, the good correct choices and selecting the right filter uh, and making sure that that's a, a good fit uh, for their uh, for their operation. You know, the need for filtration, um, most uh, drip irrigation and micro irrigation systems have some type of filtration. Uh, I've been in the business for about 21 years and I've had the opportunity to uh, travel to a lot of different places across the world and see a lot of different systems. I would say probably, you know, more than 95% of the systems that I've, uh, I've seen have had some type of filtration uh, on the farm. You know, some, you know, might be more elaborate than others, um, but regardless, uh, I think most, uh, uh, people, individuals understand that uh, filtration is extremely vital to a successful drip and micro irrigation system. Uh, you look at, uh, uh, you know, how much farmers invest per acre in some of these specialty crops, whether it's an almond crop, uh, processing tomatoes, a field of alfalfa. Uh, there's a lot that rides on uh, these crops being successful uh, not only are they applying water to the field, but they're also applying nutrients to, to the field. So these, these crops really hinge on uh, these irrigation systems doing exactly what they were designed uh, to, to do. So um, I would, uh, I, you know, I would go as far as to say that, you know, filtration is probably one of the, the single most important components of a, uh, uh, of a drip irrigation system. Uh, when we talk a little bit about uh, distri distribution uniformity, often referred to as DU, um, I like to uh, kind of refer to it as kind of a uh, kind of a report card on how uniform uh, somebody's field is. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to be above that 90%, between 90 to 95. Um, you know, if you plug your system, that's a, a, a pretty fast way to, to lower that number, mm. really, you know, put things into a tailspin. So uh, a huge emphasis on making sure that uh, 
good filtration along with a good chemical maintenance program and probably good flushing. Uh, all three of these things really together um, are gonna make sure that you keep a, a good uniform DU uh, for your fills. So Kevin, that's interesting to me uh, because of what you just said about filtration. I know it's so vital to any system, yet um, we had a bunch of people sign up right away for this uh, webinar right, to learn about filtration. How do you think they're learning about filtration besides on things like this webinar? I think, uh, I mean, there's so much information out there. Um, I mean, there's a, a ton of literature uh, to, to read. There's, there's uh, the Irrigation Association, I think does a good job, um, you know, promoting uh, good irrigation management practices. Um, I, I know that we, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of uh, blog articles you know, where we spend time talking about production practices and, and things, uh, you know, how, how, you know, people can make systems better. So. I just think, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of video, a lot of print material, uh, you know, academia has done a really good job uh, educating people. Um, you know, I, I've got to go way back to when I was in college and, and took a water management class, but even then, 25 years ago, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, filtration and, and you know, different uh, steps and procedures. You're trying to protect, you know, your backyard lawn or, you know, a million dollar investment, um, you know, for say blueberries. Um, you know, they're both important. And uh, so, yeah, I think. Uh, so, so you feel for the most part, people are doing filtration right, right now, that I they figure it out. To, I think there's room to improve. I mean, you, you know, you, you get on a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, you know, farms and you kind of see, you know, uh, different things that you can do to Im improve uh, something. And I think that's why we're all here. You know, I think most people are hoping that they can walk away with one or two nuggets of information that they can take back to their customer um, and, and improve, you know, an on-farm, you know, efficiency program. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. I, I recently read uh, an article and I, I kind of backed this up with just asking, you know, colleagues and, um, you know, people in the industry, you know, what the number one cause of failure for subsurface drip irrigation uh, around the world and uh, probably no surprise, but plugging really is the number one cause uh, of failure for SDI. Mm -hmm. S SDI is subsurface drip irrigation system. And, and the expectation with SDI is that you're gonna put it in the ground and you're gonna leave it in the ground for as long as you possibly can. Uh, we know of operations that for sure get more than 10 years, you know, sometimes 15, 20, maybe up to 25 years. So, um, good way to ensure that you are going to get the longevity that you expect is to have a good filtration uh, system. Uh, again, along with a good maintenance program and a good flushing um, protocol. Uh, these three things combined together are really going to avoid uh, any kind of instance when it comes to uh, when it comes to plugging. So Kevin, the plugging you refer to here is mostly, mostly plugging from the inside, not root intrusion. Right, yeah, I, I'm talking about, um, you know, when you're pumping from a source, whether it's groundwater or surface water, um, you've got to be careful, you know, what's coming out of, of either of those. Uh, root intrusion, a lot of times is kind of a symptom. Uh, we see root intrusion really start to flourish uh, and, and for those that don't know what root intrusion is, root intrusion is where the, the roots of a plant actually make its way into the emission device. Um, if you've plugged your, your, your drip tape or your emitter line and you're putting out a fraction of the amount of water that you normally would and you have roots anywhere near there, um, they're probably, you know, if it's, if it's still a little bit wet, they're probably going to go. Uh, and force a little bit more where that water source is at. And so when something gets plugged, uh, we see root intrusion is kind of a secondary symptom that, that happens a, yeah. a lot with it. So it, it, it gets compounded really, right? You kind of hit you hit twice with uh, something. You can, you can unplug um, an irrigation system uh, sometimes. Uh, you can rarely unplug a, uh, a root intrusion system. You've got to really, you, you almost have to shock it with some kind of a heavy uh, chemical to try and burn those roots back out. It can be done, um, but it'll take some time and it is expensive. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. No problem. Uh, you know, it's good to understand kind of what your source is 
Yeah. Yeah, there's, there, there's really, uh, you know, for this presentation, there's really two sources that we're gonna talk about, uh, surface water uh, and groundwater. And surface water really is you know, your, your lakes, your reservoirs, uh, maybe small ponds, uh, canals, rivers, streams. Uh, you, these are all um, examples of surface water. And uh, you, you know, as you're, as you're pulling out of a lake or a pond, you're, you're probably gonna experience a little bit more uh, organic material uh, in there. Um, you, you may, if the conditions are right, you, you may see uh, an algae bloom or you just might see algae uh, in general. And uh, I, I know, you know, a Jane Sand Media really does a great job trying to filter out, you know, twigs and small, you know, pieces of uh, organic material or, or algae itself. So um, with rivers, uh, canals, streams, you know, they carry a little bit more of a load of silt and clay. And, uh, you know, silt and clay are very difficult to filter out. In most cases, they're gonna pass right through your filtration system. Uh, and at that point, you really wanna make sure that you've taken the thought and precaution to have a, uh, a product that, uh, you know, whether it's a sprinkler or a drip product that has a good um, cross section as far as the emitter pathway, uh, something that has quite a bit of velocity and, and turbulence. Uh, you really want to carry that those particles right through your emission device and uh, out into the field. So, um, just uh, you know, little little insight on uh, on that. When it comes to groundwater, you know, we're really talking about pumping out of wells primarily, and uh, you know that water when you compare it to surface water is going to be you know, quite a bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have your casing just right or you know if your water levels uh, have changed you can uh, see instances where you pump sand from your system and uh, a, you know a, a sand separator is probably a good option uh, if you've got heavy loads of sand uh, if, you, if you just have uh, moderate amounts a jane spin clean filter does an excellent job uh, filtering that out a, a jane sand media filter would do a, a great job as well um, you know, the spin clean might be a little bit more affordable uh, in, in that case, um, but uh, both uh, really good options. Yeah, one thing I've noticed, Kevin, is anytime I go someplace that has any type of dirty water, you know, from a lake or pond or a stream, and we want to start talking about irrigation within the first couple seconds, you know, um, filters come up, right? Everybody wants to know how to filter out this uh, uh, silt and, and it becomes a big topic for them. So uh, really, really glad you're sharing that information with us today. Yeah, just, just to give you a quick story, I, I've got a, uh, a customer or an end user that uh, uh, farms in Oregon and uh, uh, onion farmer that was using drip irrigation and had one of our Jane Sand Medias. And uh, he was, uh, his water, he was actually getting for free in through, uh, you know, a canal system. Uh, through a ditch system, but all of that water that he was irrigating with was coming from upstream uh, from, uh, you know, everybody that farmed upstream. And so he was getting all of that tail water uh, wow. runoff from a lot of these furrow fields. Uh, he was able to, um, with a good sand media filter, um, good drip tape uh, from Jane, uh, he was able to avoid any kind of plugging because he had already kind of thought through what the silt load was going to be. Uh, he was very aggressive on flushing his drip lines and uh, actually added a, a, a chemical maintenance program as well. And so between those three things, um, really had a, a great crop and did not plug uh, his drip system. That's great to hear, yeah, that it's kind of the combination. Yeah. Uh, understanding the numbers, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I, I did want to just kind of show um, in, in our industry, we, we talk primarily about mesh uh, the size of the mesh, um, but you can see I've listed the microns and the inches and the millimeters uh, alongside. I've highlighted in blue, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, for this uh, uh, webinar, we're really kind of focused on this 120 mesh to 200 mesh as we talk about our drip irrigation products and our micro sprinklers. Um, you know, I, in this range, you know, we've got products that do a good job filtering out anything that, that really is kind of in this range. Uh, so if we say, for example, we have something that's at 150 mesh, um, it's gonna filter out, um, you know, everything, 
everything above it. So, you know, your, your sand, your fine sand, your beach sand, that's all going to get filtered um, and, uh, and really get caught up in the filter. And, you know, we would back flush that out. Anything below that, and I kind of talked about silts and clays, uh, you're going to have a really hard time with any filter uh, filtering that out. Uh, those are going to pass through the uh, the filtration system, and again, it goes uh, down to good planning uh, to make sure you've got the right product um, you know, that's got good velocity that can push that stuff uh, right through. Uh, this is just uh, an illustration of a screen, and I thought this would be a good reference value when you when we talk about mesh. People say, "Well, what exactly is mesh?" Um, if we have 150 mesh. Uh, uh, filter, it's really referring to uh, in one linear inch, you'll have 150 openings within that linear inch. So 150 mesh refers to 150 um, openings in one linear inch. As you increase the mesh size, and so if you go from 150 to 200, you now have 200 openings per linear inch. And each one of those openings are going to be smaller, right? So as you go up in mesh size, um, you're getting to a finer level of filtration and you're going uh, to a lower number in micron uh, value. So uh, a rule of thumb that we use is that uh, for micro sprinklers, um, we take one seventh the uh, size of the diameter of the smallest uh, cross section. And in drip tape or drip irrigation, we take one tenth the diameter of the size of the smallest passageway. And we use that um, as our reference value um, to determine what filtration level really should be appropriate. Um, there's no need for uh, you know, anyone to really go and, and, and do this measure. Uh, we've already done it. We've, uh, we've had these things uh, published uh, in our uh, literature with the, uh, the appropriate uh, filtration requirements. So that information is all available uh, on our website. And we do have printed material as well. If, uh, if you would like that, you can uh, reach out to any one of us uh, to get that information. Um, so hopefully that uh, kind of explains, um, you know, what mesh is and, and kind of what that looks like. Yeah, that, that really helps. The, uh, the higher the number, the smaller the opening, so. Correct. Yeah, great, thank uh, you. At, at this time, I, I just, I wanna introduce uh, Art Hal. Art is one of our territory sales managers. Uh, he's been with the company for a number of years. Uh, he's got a, a pretty good uh, skill set when it comes to valves and filters, and we thought it would be good to have him uh, share uh, with us some of his information uh, regarding the Jane Sand Media filter. So at this point, Art, I'd like to turn the time over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. So the purpose of a sand media system is to have a higher degree of filtration with an automatic flush cycle. Jane sand medias can use many types of sand, but in most agricultural applications, we choose the sand that gives us between 120 and 250 mesh filtration. Sand medias are typically used on surface water, which has high amounts of debris and organics. Debris load requires the automatic flush to prevent the filter from plugging during operation. Jane Media filters require a minimum total system flow of 375 gallons per minute with a limited options for maximum flow range. We just need to add more tanks to the system for the flow increases. Our tank requires 190 gallons per minute to properly backwash. We like to see a minimum of 20 PSI on the discharge side during backwashing in some cases, this may require a pressure sustaining, normally open valve to hold back pressure on the underdrain. Each tank takes 1,300 pounds of sand. Typically, the sand gets replaced every three to five years, but each year you'll need to add at least a bag of sand per tank because when you go into the backwash cycle, you use a, you'll lose a small handful every time. So we take a lot of pride in building our tanks and use a high strength carbon steel with an exterior epoxy coat and interior polyester coating 
to prevent any abrasion or oxidation. We have also oversized our top manhole as well as a side access port to make it extremely easy to add or remove sand as well as servicing the under drain. If anyone has had to service a tank, they'll definitely appreciate the larger opening that we have to offer. Our tanks are rated up to 100 PSI and they come with a standard five year warranty. Hey Art, I have a question here. How, how do I know what sand to buy to put in my sand filter? Well, it depends on what you're trying to filter out. You'll need to know your nozzle and how big it is and what particles can pass through it. So depending on that, you would use a different type of crushed sand silica in order to get your different meshes. So you would need to look into your nozzles and figure that out. Okay, and if, uh, if I'm not sure about that, I can contact you. You'll help me go through the, the spreadsheets or whatever we have to do to do that? Yes, of course, not a problem. Okay. So when different configurations, we offer all the standard configurations depending on the number of tanks needed for each specific field site. One of the reasons for different configurations to optimize the footprint or reduce the manhole size. In other words, we typically wouldn't have a 10 tank inline system as the stainless steel manifolds would be very large and costly for you. We can use a center feed instead and actually reduce the manifold diameter, making the system more cost effective for you. Now, in this diagram, we're showing how a back flush is performed. Dirty water enters through the top manifold and gets filtered through the media and clean water exits the bottom of each tank. When back wash is initiated, the valve closes the inlet to the tank and it opens them to the backwash manifold. This reverses the flow of water. The clean water that now comes in from the under drain flows up through the media, carrying any debris to the backwash discharge. This process is repeated for each tank individually until they have all been flushed. I also want to point out our unique under drain design. This is really what sets us apart from our competitors. We, are, we arrange our candles in a full covering pattern with 74 mushrooms to eliminate all dead spots. The water not only moves upwards, but also laterally to completely liquefy or lift the media to dislodge all debris. So this slide really shows how water comes through a tank during backwash. You can visually see how the mushroom under drain design has a complete coverage during that backwash cycle. On the other hand, you can see many dead spots on a leading competitor's tank, especially along the edges. This will promote incomplete lift of the media and an incomplete flush. What happens is the water will channel upwards through the media, the dead spots will remain impacted with dirt or debris. This will cause the filter to plug much more frequently, requiring more cycles during an irrigation event. We size media systems based on water quality and the total square feet of filtration area. Each Jane tank has approximately 12.5 square feet all sand media systems need between 15 and 25 GPM per square foot, depending on the quality of water. The dirtier water you have, the lower GPM you'll have per square foot, versus the cleaner water you have, the more GPM per square foot. We typically say on average of 250 gallons per minute per a tank. This can be plus or minus 50 GPM. So a good rule of thumb is 200 gallons per minute for dirty water, 250 for average, and then 300 gallons per minute for clean water. The simple map below shows how we can calculate this. I strongly encourage a water sample to determine the quality of your water. Understand, Water quality does not change over time or season. Oh, sorry, water quality does change over time or season. It may be best to 
uh, go on the error side of things and have a bigger system so you can have caution if you need to filter out more than what you may think. Adding more concrete, changing a controller, adding a tank will be more costly after the fact. So our, in the Central Valley, you know, what's the typical size of a sand media filter? Is it two tanks, 10 tanks? Is there a max? What, uh, what have you seen out there? Well, you want to at least have a minimum of three tanks. So when you go into the backwash cycle, one tank will be supplying water to the fill while another tank is supplying water to the tank that's being in the backwash cycle. So you really need to know how many gallons per minute you need in the fill and keep in mind that you're gonna need 190 gallons per minute for your backwash cycle. So you wanna buy enough tanks according to that. So what you see right here is sizing a sand media filter. You absolutely need to consult with your dealer to understand the pump capacity and what will happen when your system goes into backwash. Your overall system demand will go up by 190 gallons per minute during that backwash cycle and it has to be accounted for. Dealers must design an excessive cap capacity to handle that cycle. It may be a downstream pressure sensor that tells the VDF to speed up and generate the appropriate flow, or if the pump cannot do it, then a pressure sustaining valve that's normally open will be used to rob water from your system to use to clean out that tank. <clears throat> In some cases, extra tanks may be added to help handle that extra flow for the backwash. That's really helpful, thank you. Yeah. So we use an Alextronics controller as the brains of our system. This is a very reliable and simple controller to program. The first dial is to set how often the system flushes. This should be the primary trigger to start a wash. The backup will be the pressure differential switch. That will start in the event you get a recommended seven to 10 PSI loss. When guys have a very clean water, the PD switch may never start a backwash cycle. This will allow the silts and clays to penetrate deep into the sand, potentially plug the mushrooms. Washing every four to six hours will prevent this from happening. The next two dials are set to time, um, the next two dials are set for the back wash. These are cumulative dials with one doing the minutes and the other one doing the seconds. Typically, we set these about around two minutes, but I strongly recommend adding an additional 30 seconds just to make sure you have that good back wash cycle. Huh. The last dial at the bottom is called the dwell, which is the time the control waits to cycle to the next valve. We want to make sure that the first valve fully closes before opening that next tank. This usually takes about 30 to 40 seconds. Electronics has some advanced features at the back of the panel that would help a dealer determine if he needs that pressure sustaining valve. It has a built-in adjustable pre-drill to delay the start so that the valve has time to close to generate the proper back pressure. Now, if you have any questions with that, feel free to email me, see a dealer, we'll be able to help you out with that. So next up is Justin Evans. He's our territory sales manager for Northern California. He's been with Jane for almost 13 years and has a vast knowledge of the operations of our spin clean filters. All right, Justin, with that, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Art. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that. Um, so what is a spin clean? Uh, the spin clean filter is a manually flushing screen filter. And uh, by manually flushing, I mean there's no controllers or solenoids, unlike uh, the sand medias, that that's really kind of the backbone of that operation for, for the flush. Um, our screen filters do not have any sort of, of automation built into it. Um, these filters can be offered in both plastic and spin and uh, steel. Uh, ranging anywhere from three quarter inch all the way up to a 12 inch uh, connection. Our plastic filters are, are most often used in landscaping or small agricultural uh, applications. They operate anywhere from nine to 110 gallons a minute. Uh, 
the larger epoxy coated steel filters, they're, they're more robust for our agricultural applications. Uh, we fully coat them inside and out with a 3M Scotch coat fusion epoxy. Um, and they operate anywhere from 50 to 2,800 gallons a minute, some even around 3,000. Um, we offer these in uh, 30, 50, 150, and 200 mesh stainless steel elements. Um, this is kind of unique to, to us and, and when it comes to the, the screen because it's three layers censured or fused together to form one solid layer. The first layer is a 304 stainless steel perforated screen just for structural support. It's got quarter inch openings in it. That's fused with a 316 stainless steel 30 mesh as well as whatever mesh you select. So if it's a 50 mesh, that layer is going to be fused with a 30 mesh that's then going to be fused to the perforation. Uh, so it's really three layers all basically melted together to form one solid screen. So Justin, really it's going to be nearly impossible for me to get to a flow range that a spin queen filter can handle, right? That's correct. We, we, we go from, from very small to very large. I mean, we even use them on our, on our command water for our spin cleaner for our sand media filters. So, yeah, they, they go from one off, one size all the way up. And in some cases, you might run a couple in parallel next to each other just to double your flow. So, yeah, we we're really unlimited here. Yeah, thank you. No problem. So, the basic operation of a spin clean is very simple. The dirty water enters through the through the inlet where it first runs into a spin plate. It jets the water at, a, at an angle that causes the water itself to spin down the inside of the screen. Um, I've, ha I've had the question, what spins in here? My spin filter, and some people think that these things, something is spinning inside. It's actually the water that's spinning. The spin plate itself does not spin. It causes the water to spin or vortex. Um, that's kind of the key to this whole, fil this whole filter because as that spins, it's pushing the debris down along the the inner part of the screen and pushing it and keeping it in the debris basin. Um, from there, the water actually moves, uh, the clean water moves through the, through the filter it, from the inside to out and out to discharge. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Justin, because for you know, a long time I thought maybe that spin plate did spin and I worry about friction or wearing out or you know, how, how does this, how does it spin? Is there a bearing or whatever? So. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting that it just stays stationary. Yeah, and and it's so some of the things like it spins the water pretty quick, and if you have a you know uh, a high amount of sand, for example, spinning the water so quick, you can actually sandblast the inner part of the screen. So we we make custom spin plates with sand guards, things like that. So you know there's there's extra things that we do, but it is the water that's jetting and spinning. So yeah. definitely not the plate. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay, so again, we're talking about this, this spin plate. Um, that really is the difference between our filter and everybody else's. This is what makes us very unique to any other manual screen filter on the market. Um, typically, manual screen filters are sized by surface area, and they're trying to maximize the surface area, so they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, depending on the load of uh, solids that, are that you're trying to filter. They are expected to plug over time. They run them until they plug, and then they have to try to flush them out, pressure wash them. Where our filter, um, the spin, the spin plate keeps things pushing and moving to the debris basin, where we typically run it cracked open, so so things will will not build up over time, um, and stay clean. In fact, the majority of the spin cleans in my local area. They operate for multiple irrigations, if not an entire season, before they have to clean the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the plastic spin cleans and how we properly size them and, and select the right plate. Um, all of our spin plates have been engineered to have a certain degree of, of spin, of vortex that's happening. Um, and that's all based around the, fl the flow rate. So if you look at this chart, we can select uh, the proper filter based on the, the flow rate of your system. Um, 
if the standard plate that comes with it and in, in our you can see our three quarter is a is a not it's a, a two it's a two hole standard the one inch is a two hole standard so those, those two filters um, are, are standard where the four hole in the inch and a half and the four hole in the two inch are standard so if I ordered a two hole or excuse me a, a four hole two inch filter and I had a hundred gallons a minute I'm perfect, but if I had 60 gallons a minute, I'd actually have to order the spin plate that has a three hole and swap them out. Um, one cool trick that we can do here is, uh, Richard, you can probably verify this with some of your customers. If I have a two inch line in a landscape, in a large landscape, they may want a two inch filter so they're not reducing anything or anything like that. So they may just say, I need a two inch filter, but it's only 40 gallons a minute. And in that case, I can go to the uh, inch and a half plate and interchange it with a two inch filter. So all of our inch and a half plates and uh, two inch plates are interchangeable between the two filters. And the same is true with our three quarter and one inch. That's great. So I don't have to go out and buy another filter. I don't, uh, I can not necessarily, well, I want to be sure which one I'm getting for my application, but if I make the mistake, all I have to do is swap out, uh, swap out that plate. Yeah. Exactly. Or if, if you decided to pour a bunch of concrete and cut half your zone off, I don't have to change my filter. I can right. change my plate. That's great. Now, very similar uh, deal with the epoxy coated larger uh, steel spin, spin cleans. But we have a little bit more flexibility because we can plug, instead of changing the plate, we can plug the holes in each plate. So we have this chart that uh, gives us, shows us that, that degree of flexibility here to where uh, we can not only size the plate, uh, the plate, but we can also further adapt it and really dial this thing in. Um, when you're selecting one of these, I definitely would select to the left side of this chart. Um, over time, typically our wells, whether it's at the, in April when the, when the groundwater is really high versus September when the groundwater is dropped, typically the well water and your discharge flows de decrease over a season or year to year, whether it's a drought year or a wet year. And so the discharge of the rate of the pump tends to, to only go down. Um, with that being said, if I'm already got three holes plugged and my flow rate falls off, I'm stuck. I can't change. I got to, I got to downsize my filter. So if we go with, as close to a fully open plate as we can initially, I can always add a plug as the season moves on and, and, and keep up with what's going on in my well. Um, I, usually, I usually recommend when, when somebody puts a new system in and everything is working great, they come with two plugs, take, one, take those plugs, put them in your electrical panel. So if you do ever need one, it's right there. You might have five different size spin cleans and if you're trying to go to the barn and find the right plug you're going to be frustrated put in the electrical panel you have it um, that's a really good practical tip right because i mean <laughs> you know me well i can't find anything so uh yeah it's always there i like that yeah and, and when they are properly plugged you will see a five to seven pound loss so when you take that screen clean screen you want to make sure that you're that you're witnessing a five to ten psi loss you know you got the proper um, so here's some uh, tips for, for these, uh, for proper use of a spin clean. Um, the best way to avoid plugging this filter is to have your dealer size your irrigation zones or your landscape contractor to where they're equal in size. And even when I say equal in size, I mean equal in flow. Um, that will keep a consistent spin rate no matter which zone is on or which block is on. Um, Sometimes it can't be done where you have, you have to have one smaller section. And in those cases, I would definitely put my plugs in for that smaller section to make sure that when I have the lowest flow, I have the right amount of spin. Um, on the higher flows, it's gonna spin a little bit faster. I mentioned earlier using a sand guard, if you have a high degree of sand and you have that situation, we have things to help protect the screen from the sand blasting. But on the higher zones, you, you, you may see a 10 pound loss, which is, which is a little bit more than I like to see, but it's, it's a way to make this filter work. Um, 
where you can't have equal size blocks. Um, an another really, really cool tip that I've that I've seen guys do, some guys, some dealers do this on every system, is they will put a uh, a discharge, an open discharge prior to the filter. Um, what happens is, is our highest volume of sand from a well, it always happens at startup and over time, the, the parts per million of sand falls. So the longer I pump, the less sand and debris I'm pumping. That, that occurs because we have drawdown, we have line fill, so you have more flow right at startup than the pump will when it's under pressure. So that will increase the velocity in the water column in the column pipe and can carry sand out right off the bat. That can impact us, it can overload a spin clean and plug it right now. If that happens, what we do is we have a little discharge, we turn the pump on, let it run for 15 minutes, an open discharge, and then send it into the filter so we, we avoid that big slug of debris. Uh, if, so Justin, when you say uh, operate with the flush valve cracked open, mm -hmm. is that like a drip or will it be a steady stream? Are we talking uh, a gallon a minute? What? So that, that's a great question. Um, the only time that I run that thing open that the, that flush is cracked open is when I have enough sand to overload my basin. The basin is what's going to hold it. And if it crawls up the screen, we're in trouble, right? So we want to bleed it off and it doesn't take much. Um, I don't have on a ball valve, you're going to have a real hard time saying that's one gallon a minute because it, it's either really open yeah. or closed. Yeah. But I've, I've had plenty of guys that will take a, um, and put a galvanized T in between the filter and the and the flush valve, and put a garden valve with a small garden hose running it away from the, the the pad, and and they will just literally crack that thing open to where it's it's just a trickle. Trickle, okay. Yeah, and it's just enough to keep up with the sand. So if you have a ton of sand, you might need more, but most of the time it's just it's just a trickle of water. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful, right? I wasn't sure if it was a stream, a drip, trickle. I understand. Right, right. Um, the other, um, one of the other tips on this, and then you can see from this photo, uh, we have one pressure gauge, um, that's, that's tied into two pressure ports. Always use one pressure gauge. Um, the five to seven pounds of loss on a clean screen really guarantees I have that proper spin. So if I don't know my, my inlet versus my outlet pressure to, to understand that differential, I don't know if I'm properly spinning or not. Um, sometimes we put two gauges on and years ago we used to, we found that you can have a gauge, two gauges side by side that read plus or minus two PSI. So when I'm looking for five to seven, that really can be, can be detrimental. So if you ever call me to come service one of your filters, the first thing I'm going to do is throw your pressure gauge away and put a brand new one on it just to make sure I, I know what I'm looking Um, one more trick on the stint, on the steel spin, spin clean filters, and this has to do with uh, things happening over time. They're over, somebody oversized one, they're used to a, a standard manual filter where they're looking at surface area. So they put this big filter in and don't have the flow uh, to properly spin the water, and now we're stuck. We've just welded this thing into place and, and it's oversized. Um, what's if you notice, this is actually the, the dimensions of the screens themselves. So the spin plates fits inside the screen. So any screen with the same diameter, I can put the same spin plate in there. So I get the same characteristics of a two inch filter inside of a four inch filter if I just put the plate inside of there. So that's, that's a, just a kind of a, a, a trick to that that may come up over time a well collapsed in i'm only getting half the flow maybe we can uh address that plate change it out to a, to the next size down plate and, and make this thing work um, or if you're going to move the filter somewhere else we may be able to do something to uh to make it a little bit more flexible uh, this is also true in uh the six inch high flow and the eight inch they're interchangeable they're both nine and three eighths the 10 and the 12 inch 14 and a half inches, I can swap those plates for either one. Nice, that's good to know. And uh, with that, if you, if you have any more questions, you know, feel free to, to ask me and 
Otherwise, I'll hand it back over to Mr. Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Great job. Um, yeah, you all the questions that came in, you answered during the, uh, the presentation, so thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. I appreciate uh, both you and Art spending some time kind of uh, going in great detail uh, about our Jane Sand Media filter and our Jane Spin Clean filter. Um, you know, as you can tell, we've, we've uh, invested a lot of money uh, over the years uh, in technology in both of these filters. And uh, um, it, it's interesting. Um, you, you see more and more uh, companies enter the market. And what happens is uh, it seems like uh, you know the industry gets a little commoditized. Um, you know our approach to that is, uh, you know, we want to take these filters, and uh, we'll talk specifically about our Sand Media filter, and make it a smart filter, and uh, we actually call that Jane Logic Pulse. And what uh, what that is, I'll just share just a few things. Um, we uh, we're looking. Uh, we've got a sensor here, and a sensor here and it's all run kind of off this unit right here but we're looking at the uh, the pressures uh, before the filter and after the filter and we know what the differential should be right but uh, getting this information in real time uh, to the user uh, we think is pretty uh, critical um, you know they're able to uh, you know get this information you know basically right when it happens uh, but we're looking and, and seeing you know if there is a difference and that will help us determine you know, how often we should back flush and for how long and what those intervals should be. Uh, we can also take uh, these sensors and tie it into a water meter so that we can understand what the total applied water uh, will be, uh, whether it's by, you know, event, uh, by week for the entire season. Um, you know, these are all things that uh, um, I know, uh, you know, end users really want to understand and, and, and know. So. Uh, you can also take this information and you can benchmark it to your irrigation design. And if you know that you're supposed to have a thousand gallons a minute, you know, going to the field, um, but you've got something that's less or more, right? Um, you don't need to wait, you know, for weeks. Uh, you can understand this uh, pretty quick right when this gets going. So uh, good information uh, for us. Um, we have had a webinar that, uh, in, in the past, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Jane Logic Pulse and how it works, um, you can go to our website and uh, we had a webinar that really goes into great detail about all the features and all the benefits, uh, all the different system alerts and uh, everything that comes along with it. Is can I, just, I just want to clarify one thing. So I don't have to keep checking an app the whole time my pump's running to see if it's going right. It, uh, somebody, it'll push a notification to me. It's got a push notification, exactly. Yeah, I think I think we send that out via email or via text. And uh, so that's nothing that you need to go look for. Uh, that's information that's being sent to you um, as a subscriber uh, to uh, uh, to this technology. That's great. That's, uh, I can be working on, uh, I mean, I always feel like I'm looking at my phone, right? I need an app for my app. So this, uh, this really helps me out. That's right, yep. Um, you know, we're, we're almost, we're kind of in the, the, you know, the end of June going into July, and uh, we talk about our smart irrigation filter. Uh, in our industry, we recognize July is really reserved for smart irrigation month. And, uh, you know, it's an effort for us where, you know, we really want to try and get the word and spread the message that you want to be smart about the water that you're applying and, and you know, take a little bit more effort. Um, I mean, we should all be doing this all year round, but this is a month where we dedicate and really focus uh, that. So with that said, um, we would like for the month of July to offer our Jane Logic Pulse uh, free of charge with any three uh, plus Jane Sam Media uh, tank filter. So if you order three tanks or more, we're gonna go ahead and give you for the month of July, if you do this within this month, we're gonna give you this technology uh, $2,000 value wow. uh, for free, um, again, for the month of July. So if you're on this webinar and you're interested, you're in the market for uh, some SAM media filters, uh, this would be an excellent time to uh, take a look at that. Uh, you're going to get uh, this technology uh, really along for the ride. And uh, if uh, you know of anybody that's not on this webinar that is in the market, uh, you know, uh, feel free to share this message. 
we want to make sure that uh, you know we're doing our part. We feel like it's a good way for us to give back and to promote smart irrigation through the month of July. So um, yeah, we just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that offer. And uh, Richard, just wanted to say thank you. Uh, Justin and Art, thanks again for uh, being a part of this. And uh, uh, we want to thank our audience for taking some time out uh, to listen to this webinar and to learn more about uh, our, uh, our Jane Sam Media, our Jane Spin Clean, and our, our technology offering with Jane Logic Pulse. So Richard, thanks again for uh, hosting us and I'll, uh, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Kevin and Justin and Art. This was uh, really interesting, you know, and, and uh, one thing's for sure uh, is this offer is pretty amazing. That's, I think that's the best offer we've had on any of our webinars, so thank you for that. Um, one thing that I always know too when I'm talking about something like filtration or filters, I keep on having questions, so I appreciate you guys sharing your contact information like you did. And, uh, and uh, I know I can reach out and uh, ask you guys a question and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get the, the right answer back. And I don't mean uh, the right answer, but I mean the correct answer. So I appreciate uh, your, uh, your uh, knowledge and, and your ability to help and uh, really care about uh, all our customers. So thank you guys, uh, great job. And I uh, uh, hope everybody has a nice weekend and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.